Well, welcome to another installment of our Giants in Chest Medicine. Uh, I have the distinct pleasure today to be sitting across from and interviewing Dr. Paul O'Byrne, who's currently the Chair of Medicine at McMaster University. Um, but we're going to have a, a nice conversation here and, and explore uh, you know, how he became the Chair of Medicine at McMaster University. So thanks so much for coming to spend some time with us. It's my great pleasure. So let's go back in time. So you were born in Ireland. I was born in Dublin in, in Ireland. Dublin. Yes. Uh -huh. And then I um, heard that, but then you, you left Ireland to part of time while you were growing up. You grew up in, in South Africa? That's right, yes. When I was uh, aged uh, seven, my parents emigrated to what's now Zimbabwe, it was then uh, southern Rhodesia. And we lived there for about uh, 10 years, wow. nine or 10 years. In uh, actually Zimbabwe, Zambia, it was then northern Rhodesia, and eventually South Africa before I moved back to Dublin. And what, uh, work, I mean, what, is what, what, what took you out of, out of Ireland? Well, my father was a hotelier, and okay. uh, a company in Africa hired him to run a chain of hotels that uh, uh, they had. And so he, uh, he went there, and he moved around a bit because they were opening new places, and he'd go and get it open up and then on to the next thing. And, um, uh, and then up when we were um, eventually finally settled in Johannesburg uh, for about three years, uh, they started thinking about um, relocating back to Europe. The uh, hotel chain actually bought some hotels in London and uh, so gradually we all morphed back into uh, England and then Ireland eventually. So That had to be neat though. I mean it's just a, a unique experience to... Did, do you remember, I mean were you were you scared? You thought it was cool, or hey, that's just I, this is what I do, you know? <laughs> I actually, <laughs> I actually enjoyed it immensely. Looking back at the time, of course, you know, for a young kid, it's pretty, it can be nerve-wracking having to relocate. Yeah. But an interesting uh, aspect to this um, that I didn't know at the time, but I learned uh, uh, some years later was that um, when I was a young child, uh, three, four, five years old, I had very severe asthma. I was in and out of hospital uh, regularly, um, and in those days, these were long before we had effective treatments, so it was quite a challenge having a, 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 an asthmatic child. Um, and some physician told my parents that uh, the climate, the dampness in Ireland was responsible for this. So my dad had an excellent job in Dublin, but that was part of the reason they upped and relocated to, um, to, to Africa. Um, and it turned out, in retrospect, I now know what happened. I'm very allergic to dust mite, and uh, lots of dust mite in Ireland, England, and Australia, New Zealand. But when you go to Africa, you don't have any. So my, uh, my asthma almost instantly improved. And uh, yeah, so. the physician in Dublin was correct. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't think he knew. I don't think he knew why he was correct. That's okay. But he was correct. <laughs> it's better to be lucky than good. <laughs> So, um, so asthma. We'll come to this, but asthma obviously uh, affected you personally, and, and I, I would imagine was a, a key driver ultimately in your career and your research endeavors. Yes, absolutely, it was. I mean that, and some really good luck. I, I was immensely fortunate uh, to end up eventually uh, doing my fellowship training uh, in a place at McMaster University where there was a. Uh, a world-class clinical scientist in asthma, a man called Freddie Hargreave. Um, I hadn't planned to do any research. I was uh, planning to be a busy clinical doctor and uh, uh, even had thoughts about going back to Ireland to work or to England. Um, we had family, lots of family back there and so yeah. forth. Um, but uh, I was watching and, and learning how Freddie uh, got so engaged in clinical research in asthma. And of course, because I had the disease myself, I. I knew a fair bit about the impact of the disease, particularly yeah. in, in children. And so I uh, started with one year of a, a, a research fellowship with Freddie and uh, didn't think I had any skill sets in research and this sort of grew from there. That's amazing. Yeah. So I, I want to come to that. So you, you ultimately made your way back to Ireland at, with, you know, with dad you know, as the job migrated that way. and and decided to pursue medical school, and, and you went to medical school in Dublin? Yes, I did, at University College in Dublin, yeah. Terrific, and then training after that, where, where at? A couple of years in Dublin, okay. uh, doing what we call house jobs, so right. internship, uh, senior house officer job. Um, and in those days, in Ireland at least, there were no 
well uh, designed and uh, um, uh, well organized training programs in specialties of medicine. So you essentially had to go somewhere else okay. to, if you wanted to train to go back as a specialist cardiologist, whatever it was. And so I looked around and um, looked at some jobs in the United States and uh, looked at some jobs in Canada. And the choice of Canada was again almost serendipitous. Uh, my wife, who was an Irish woman, um, had a sister living in Toronto, and so being close to her sister was important. Sure, so sure. we, uh, I was thinking about going to Boston and uh, for a little bit, and then eventually decided, no, we'd go somewhere close to Toronto, and that's how I ended up at uh, Mike Boston. Wow. Now, did you always want to be a physician? I mean, when you were a, a young boy growing up, you know, following the family business, or? You know, uh, the honest answer is no. Um, and I've thought about this subsequently. I honestly can't tell you why I ended up in medical school. I mean, I honestly, I really... You got in the wrong line? I really don't know why. I do remember uh, my father once saying, whatever you do with your life, make sure you do something that where you're always going to be busy. You'll always have people who need you. Uh, and so uh, it was good advice. I said, well, medicine sort of fits that criteria. No matter how good it is or how bad the economy is, you always need physicians. So. Right, we're recession proof. <laughs> well, more or less, exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And and when you okay, so you you end up in in medical school when when you first uh, started to pursue this endeavor. I mean, what in your mind? Were you, you know, I'm going to be a you know a family medicine doctor. I, you know, I, I'm going to be a subspecialist. Did you did you evolve into pulmonary sort of you know like a lot of people just you know as you got exposed to it or were you I'm going to be a pulmonologist. Again, a great, great question. Um, I wanted to be a pediatrician. Oh, wow. That's how I started out. Okay. And uh, I, um, uh, I spent maybe three or f four years in medical school with that in mind. Okay. Um, until I had a, s uh, a rotation in uh, a ward that managed childhood leukemia. And these were days when childhood leukemia was a fatal, universally fatal disease. Yeah. And that really turned me off pediatrics awfully quickly to see these children suffering and dying and with essentially no help at all. Thank goodness it's a completely different disease nowadays, right. but in those days that was the case. So I was sort of undifferentiated when I uh, finished my medical school training. And then again, something really fortunate happened. Uh, you know, again, it's amazing how we look back and you see all these sort of. Uh, uh, events that change your life that you had no expectation of them ever happening. And this was that when I was doing my internship, in those days we had a six month inter internship in medicine and six months in surgery. And I started out the first day at the hospital, St. Vincent's Hospital in Dublin, and I was, I was teamed, I was put with a team of a young physician uh, who had just come back from Boston. He had trained with uh, Gainsler in Boston and um, uh, came back to Dublin. His name is Murish Fitzgerald, and this was his first day as a consultant physician, and my first day as an intern. And it turned out that he was the best clinician I have ever seen, cool. and still to this day I've never seen anybody uh, with his skills. Um, he, was, he was just a brilliantly gifted physician, uh, in that he had, uh, he had um, and he was a respiratory physician. Uh, he had fantastic uh, uh, clinical acumen, first of all. But what really impressed me was that I, I've ne again, never seen anybody who had quite the ability to engage with the patient, with the patient's families, uh, and with trainees. And he, he was just a, an amazing man. And I saw this guy and I said, I want to be like that. Right. That's what I want to be like. And he was respiratory, and of course, because of my history of having respiratory disease myself, right. I, I sort of got, got into thinking about being a respiratory physician. And interestingly, if you speak to virtually any respiratory doctor who was trained in Ireland of my vintage, his name comes up as a, really? as a, as a mentor and role model that people follow. Yeah. Wow. That's, you know, in, in, in your right, I think um, you talk about like the key moments in, you know, in, re in retrospect. I mean, if you'd started in a different ward, right? Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. I mean, who knows? Absolutely. Right. The other interesting tidbit. You could be the chair of the Department of Surgery. <laughs> <laughs> the other interesting tidbit in that was the other intern on the, on the service, there were two of us, 
was a young woman, uh, and he ended up marrying her. So, <laughs> wow. so, so uh, we've uh, we've kept sort of in touch ever since. And, That's uh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you you finish your your, your house training uh, in Dublin, and you head to Toronto. Yes. Um, for uh, respiratory training, and and. At that time, how, how long was that? What was the focus? Of, was it a clinical training? It was your research fellowship? It was... So uh, when, we, when I went to Canada, I actually ended up in a place called Hamilton, um, which is about 80 kilometers west of Toronto, uh, at a medical school, McMaster University, that was actually at that time, this was in the late 70s, was a relatively new medical school. It was about, um, about 10 years old, and it was a very interesting and somewhat unusual place to work because when McMaster was founded um, its founding dean a man called John Evans completely deconstructed the medical school system completely took it apart and put it together again so I arrived at a medical school that uh, was was three years of training in medicine uh, all small group problem-based learning no examinations, no lectures, and I thought this was really strange. Now, you know, I was a, I was a resident in medicine at the time, but looking at these young students, uh, uh, and it in many ways was regarded as anathema in, uh, in sort of the, in the, in the, the people who are uh, engaged in medical school education. Right. And of course, now we know that this was a revolution that changed medical education forever. You know, small group problem-based learning is now sort of the de rigueur in right, medical right, schools right, right. Uh, around the world. That was the first place to ever do it. So it was a place that had a lot of energy, a lot of um, uh, interest in innovation, and, uh, and I, I was just really thrilled to, to, to go there. The chair of medicine at the time, when I arrived, was a man called Morin Campbell, who was one of the great men in respiratory physiology. Uh, he uh, I think he's still the youngest person ever to, ever to give the Burns Amundsen lecture at the ATS, um, and he did his work on um, uh, controlled oxygen therapy and developed the Venturi mask system. Uh, so he had a he had a fantastic track record of research and of, of clinical research that made an immense difference. In fact, he probably saved more lives than most of us put together because of when he was starting out, they gave high flow oxygen, you know, and just people with COPD were dying like flies. And he changed all of that. Uh, so anyway, the, <clears throat> the respiratory training at McMaster was extremely good. Uh, Morin had brought uh, people, he was, he was English, and he brought a number of English people with him. People came from all over the world, Jack Hirsch from Australia, and uh, a bunch of people who were developing um, areas of, uh, of uh, specialty in hematology, cardiology, right. and so on. And as I'd mentioned earlier, my mentor then became Freddie Hargreave, again an Englishman who came over with Morin uh, when Morin came to be chair of medicine. So it was a very vibrant, exciting respiratory group. And so I did two years of uh, training in medicine and then two years in respiratory training there. Okay, and then where? So after I'd finished uh, in Hamilton, I got a career award, which was uh, very, uh, very fortunate. It allowed me to essentially travel anywhere I wanted to for further postdoctoral training. Wow. And uh, I looked around a bit and decided, uh, again, an immensely fortunate decision to come here to San Francisco to work with Jane Adell at the CVRI. Um, so I spent two years at CVRI and um, the day I arrived at CVRI, uh, it was uh, early July, um, I went up, the building was on Parnassus, the, uh, the, 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 the tower, and Jay's lab was on the 13th floor, and I went up to the lab first day looking for Jay's office, wondering the call, sort of looking for signage to show where Jay was going to be. And I, I, there was a, a desk in, in the corridor with somebody sitting at the desk writing. And I, I went over and I said, excuse me, can you tell me where, uh, uh, where, where Dr. Nadell's office is, and the person at the desk was Peter Barnes. <laughs> and Peter had been there early in the morning writing because that was the fellow's desk. One desk for all the fellows. Whoever got there first got the desk. And so Peter was usually there first to get the desk. Because <laughs> so uh, at the time, the people in the lab were, were Peter Barnes and uh, Leo Fabry and uh, Mike Holtzman and uh, just extraordinary group of, uh, of 
of individuals, and I sort of fell into that. Yeah. And, uh, and Jay, of course, who was leading us all, and uh, it was an amazing two years. And in fact, again, I was there at a time when the understanding of Alzheimer changed, completely changed. And uh, to be there at the time all that was happening was just an extraordinary experience. It's incredible, and I, and I, I can only imagine what it, what it must have been like to be a fly on the wall at some of the lab discussions. Just the, the, the idea, both well, both the serious ones and the on oh, serious yeah. ones. <laughs> but I mean, just I mean, incredible. Just the the, the people there, and, and and to be surrounded, like you said, when you were first at McMaster, and then then the CVRI. I mean, just the the ideas being thrown around, and I, you know, I, the McMaster going back to there. You know, I had always had, the description I've been told was the from the very beginning it was a place that was built with purposely without silos. That's you know, correct. there were yes. no fiefdoms. It That's was correct. That you know to, to to get better collaborations going, yeah. right? Yeah. Absolutely. And you always felt that, and it sounds like you kept following that. Absolutely true. And again, you know, it's 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 hard to imagine one could, looking backward, have picked these opportunities, but they seem to just happen. You know, quite quite amazing. Yeah. Where to after the CVRI? When I was finished, uh, two years there, um, we had had our uh, first child, my wife and I, and uh, we were expecting a second one. So we looked around a little bit, and um, uh, I was offered a couple of opportunities to come back to Canada to work, one at, uh, uh, in Vancouver at UBC. But um, uh, Jack Hirsch, uh, who was uh, now the chair of medicine at McMaster, um, met with me and talked me uh, talked to me quite a bit about the opportunities at McMaster and because uh, I knew it well I knew the people right. well I decided to move back to McMaster and so that's that's what happened. and then and there it is <laughs> how are things be uh, this is a loaded question how are things being the chair of medicine <laughs> I've enjoyed it immensely I've been chair for 14 years now so quite quite a long time I'm actually just finishing my term uh, the end of June, so it'll be a sort of another change for me uh, coming up. Um, but it's been a real privilege and a pleasure to be involved with the group of people in, in the department uh, as we have. <clears throat> in large part because uh, what you said earlier about the place still remains true today. It's an immensely collegial and collaborative place to work. Um, I honestly don't know anything quite like it. Not that I've ever seen. I'm sure there are places that are, that are like that, well, probably much better than we are. But it, as a place to work, uh, to enjoy colleagues and to develop collaborative relationships, is nothing like it. It's, it's really extraordinary. And, uh, and that's the culture. That's the culture we have. That's the culture we have. And we've, uh, we've grown, and, and uh, the department has some areas of immense expertise. Uh, um, in hematology, thrombosis, cardiology, respiratory, GI. We're not expert and great in everything in research, but, um, but there's a, a, lot of, a lot of success, and much of it is actually in translational research, which is an area that I particularly uh, enjoy. What's next, then? You said you're coming to the end of a term here for the chair. What's next for you? So uh, I'm going to be the dean of the faculty uh, and the vice president of health sciences at McMaster in July. Wow. First. Yeah, so. That seems like a uh, daunting task. <laughs> well, yeah, I can't say that I'm not apprehensive. Uh, <laughs> I am definitely uh, a bit um, concerned about the size of the job. In our place at McMaster, the dean is dean of the medical school. And I know the medical school actually pretty well. I've been chair for a long time. I know the strengths, the weaknesses. I know where most of the skeletons are hidden, most not all, uh, you know, so I'm pretty comfortable with that. But as vice president of health sciences, I'm also responsible for nursing, for uh, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, midwifery, uh, physician assistant program, and so on. So I have a very steep learning curve ahead of me, that's for sure. Definitely. But hey, it's a, a neat opportunity, I bet. Yeah. Learn something new, right? Yeah, absolutely. So keep it from getting stale. So when you, uh, if you could go back in time, what would you tell a younger version of yourself? Hey, you know, you shouldn't have done that. Like, you know, what, what, what would you correct if you could, if, if anything? Um, and what advice, and then that same kind of vein, what advice would you give to people who are watching this who are early in their career? and want to have a, a long and distinguished career like yourself, and what, what advice could you give them? 
The first thing I think I would say to a young person starting out uh, is that um, a life, a professional life in academic medicine is by some distance the best job in the world. I, I, I just cannot imagine there's anything that one does that brings more satisfaction than the job we have. I feel blessed and very fortunate to have been given the opportunity to, uh, to do this. And there's lots of reasons for that. Um, one, of course, is the research side and the uh, enjoyment you get um, from, from the journey, the research journey. Uh, often the, the destination can be a bit disappointing when you, you know, don't get results you're expecting or it doesn't turn out the way you want, but, but the journey is what's really exciting. And then, of course, every now and again, uh, something happens that that, that changes the way you think and maybe changes the way other people think and that changes knowledge forever and that doesn't happen often but when it happens it is a gift from God it really there's nothing quite like that so the research side is is a big piece of it but in academic medicine we are of necessity surrounded by young people young energetic smart generally very nice people who uh, who, who, who want to do good things, who are there for the right reasons. And, and I immensely enjoy that. I, I think that's, uh, that's another important aspect of it. And thirdly, by and large, the colleagues you have in academic medicine are outstanding people. I wouldn't say everybody all the time, but by and large, they are remarkable people, talented, uh, obviously very smart, very nice to work with. Uh, and, and I think actually, I have a maybe a, not maybe, I do have a biased view here. Because I'm a chair of a department, I see all specialties. We have 17 specialties in the Department of Medicine, all of the ologies we have there. Right. Respirology or pulmonary medicine is different in many aspects to some of the others in that we have a group of people in it that are just fabulous people. And, um, it's, it's very unusual for me to even try to think of somebody I wouldn't enjoy having a beer with or eating a meal with or chatting to. Uh, I wouldn't say that's quite the same in every specialty, but pulmonary medicine seems to attract people that, that like to do that. So, uh, so that's the first thing. The job is fantastic. The job is fantastic. The second thing is you don't need to be brilliant. You don't have to be brilliant. We have brilliant people. That's great. Most of us aren't brilliant. Most of us are just pretty average, but we want to do good things. We want to make a difference. And I'll say, if, if, I, if I could wish one, one thing on anybody who wants to succeed, it's persistence. Persistence, I think, for me, is the one attribute that makes a difference more than anything else. Because you're going to get pushed back a lot. That's going to happen. There's going to be failure but you've got to get through it, you've got to, you've got to persist through it. Yeah. And, and there's, there's always an upside, eventually. Um, so I, I do feel a little um, disappointed when I see young people who get a hit, you know, grants don't get funded, or their paper doesn't get into the very best journals, or something like that, and they get discouraged and begin to lose momentum, and then eventually stop, stop doing research. That, 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 you know, that's a real shame. And the people I've seen that have done brilliantly have generally been very good at that. Learning from the mistakes, learning from the, 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 the pushbacks they've had, and then carrying on. That's really excellent advice. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, and, and, and it's, you know, and you're, you're right. I, the, that advice, I've, I've it's, been a, it's a theme, you know, when we've asked people this question, it's, it's, and, and you're, I think, especially the persistence component yeah. to it. Um, let's talk about your research, and let's talk about, um, you, you know, all the accolades and career accomplishments. I guess the first question I wanted to ask you, you know, there's, there's I think when, there's a long list of things, I think, when your name comes up that people in their mind generate, but what's the thing that you're most proud of work-wise? If you could pick one, you, you, yeah, I'll no, give you a couple. You can give a couple. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's one thing that I think um, I've been part of. I, I can't obviously claim credit 
for this, but I've certainly been part of the revolution in our thinking of asthma and the focusing of it as an inflammatory disease rather than a disease of bronchoconstriction and twitchy airways, which is the way it was when I started out. And the emphasis on, um, on using anti-inflammatory therapy, particularly inhaled steroids, and the fact that when, again, when I started, um, the use of inhaled steroids was thought to be best reserved for people with really difficult asthma. When you were struggling with lots of bronchodilators, then you considered adding a steroid. We have completely changed that thinking, whereby maintenance therapy, even in milder disease, is seen to be, is seen to be uh, a, an appropriate way to treat patients. And when you look back, uh, again in the 70s, early 80s, um, there were the, the focus on asthma were on these dreadful epidemics of mortality that were occurring. In New Zealand, in Australia, in the United Kingdom, somewhat in Canada, here in the United States. Um, fortunately now, this is what, 30 years or so, asthma mortality is essentially gone. I mean, it's never completely gone, but it's a very rare event where somebody uh, to die of asthma. And uh, like just recently, I've seen some papers, uh, some work published uh, from, from Ontario where I work published in the Blue Journal, uh, showing that uh, not only is mortality rate essentially disappeared, uh, particularly younger people uh, almost disappeared, but hospitalization rates uh, in Ontario are down by more than half in the past 12 years. Wow. And uh, I've been sort of trying to find out more information. It's true in Australia, it's true in New Zealand, uh, I think it's true here in the United States, that that, that focus on maintenance which I think is the reason, maintenance anti-inflammatory therapy has, has really changed the face of this disease. I, I, I agree, and I think it's, it's, it's always fascinating. One of the things I love the most about doing these interviews is, is hearing people's perspective on you know, things now that, I mean, anybody learning pulmonary medicine now, it's, 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 of course they're on inhaled steroids, right? Yes. You know, yes. How could they not be? Yes. And, you know, to see the, the, the culture shift, yes. like literally, and to be yeah. a part of it, that, that, yeah. Yeah. that is definitely, you, and you talked about, uh, you know, kind of in your advice about, and why, you know, academic medicine, the, these, these moments where, you know, you get the, the privilege of being a part yes. of a, a, a yeah. true change. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, let's, let's talk about your research. Let's, yes. what, what are you, uh, are you, are you still, you know, I, I, with all of your responsibilities, I have to imagine your research endeavors are less busy than they were back in the day. You know, uh, maybe not. <laughs> no, they, they, they actually are not, which well, is see, that's uh, great, which then. is which is uh, 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 yeah, a, a real blessing, I have to say. I've been very fortunate. Again, I talk about luck a lot, but I really do think that uh, fortune has smiled on me very often. But I have a. Um, a uh, colleague at McMaster University, Dr. Gail Gavreau, who was a PhD student in my lab and uh, joined the faculty and uh, is now a full professor at our, at our university. And uh, she and I have worked together closely for probably 15 years and she essentially manages, she, she runs the lab. She's uh, gotcha. a fantastic uh, scientist and um, the lab has been as productive or more productive when, than when I was doing it myself. In fact, I suspect they dread the day I walk into the lab. I do show up from time to time, <laughs> but I still feel I still feel a part of it. And of uh, and the lab is focusing on um, uh, the mechanisms by which environmental allergens um, initiate uh, infl airway inflammation, initiate the eosinophilic and basophilic inflammatory response that occurs when an asthmatic is exposed to an allergen. And again, I have to say probably that relates back to my own experience as a child with house dust mite and, uh, and severe asthma. Um, and we're looking at um, uh, a number of things, the way that dendritic cells uh, pick up a signal, uh, the way they um, then uh, uh, express that signal to T cells, uh, and then initiate the bone marrow's response, increasing inflammatory cells, trafficking of those cells into the blood, into the airway, uh, how all that's regulated. And it turns out, again, we had a, 
an aha moment about three years ago that, again, just completely changed my thinking about this. And I've been doing this now for many, many years. But we had an opportunity to study um, a monoclonal antibody directed against a, uh, a cytokine that's predominantly expressed by the airway epithelium. It's called uh, a TSLP, thymic stromal lymphopoietin. And um, we were interested in whether or not the, uh, this cytokine, epithelial drive cytokine, was engaged in activating the dendritic cell axis. It's thought to, and in mouse models it, it does, but it's never been studied in that way in, in humans with asthma. And so we gave people the antibody or placebo and double-blind crossover study, and uh, it did work. It worked quite well. It, um, it stopped the allergen-induced uh, changes in dendritic cell trafficking and eosinophilic inflammation. That was great. That was, but that's what we expected. What we didn't expect was much more interesting. What we, what we didn't expect was that when you take these young asthmatics, now these are mainly university students working on our campus, they come in, uh, they have very mild asthma, they're not on regular treatment or else we couldn't do the challenges with them, but they have symptoms, they have uh, uh, um, a history of allergic uh, symptoms during a season, and they always have baseline inflammation. Blood eosinophil counts are elevated, sputum eosinophil counts are slightly elevated, pheno levels are increased. Not greatly, but significantly, but consistently. Yeah. Yeah. We gave these young folks one dose of the antibody, one single dose, and within one week, every single parameter of inflammation normalized, completely normalized in every single subject. Wow. And that was completely unexpected. And that tells us that even in mild asthmatic subjects, that there is a constitutive release of this cytokine, TSLP, that is causing, it has to be causing, this baseline inflammatory response in asthma. And then when you put an allergen in, there's an increased expression and a much bigger uh, effect. And so that's one of those moments you live for because um, you, know, you spend, I've been 30 years in this business doing research on allergic asthma. This was completely unexpected to me, that the epithelium itself is actually regulating very, very carefully the inflammatory response, even in a basal state. It's an exciting time in asthma right now, too. I mean, you know, just the, the first revolution with kind of changing the thought process of what drugs and inhaled steroids, but now, you know, breaking things down to a, to a cytokine level and trying to have a more directed yes. based therapies. I mean, we can, you know, ignore the merits of which target yes. we should be going yes. after, but just sure. the concept yes. Of, yes. of trying to be a little more yes. per, uh, precise, I guess, exactly. would be the right word. Exactly. Right? I actually think we are one of the leaders in personalized medicine, uh, in, certainly in respiratory diseases. Now, of course, in cancer, they, they've been doing this and doing it successfully. But, but in asthma, um, we can now, I think, identify at least a subset of patients uh, who have really difficult to manage asthma, severe refractory asthma, with a persisting eosinophilia in whom these biologics will work extremely well. And we didn't have that three, five, seven years ago. Right. Yeah. It's exciting times. Yeah. What haven't we talked about that, that you were like, oh, I agreed to do this, and that bozo across from me never asked me this? <laughs> <laughs> you have been very thorough. I have to say, you've, dra you've dredged things into my memory banks I hadn't had remembered in many years. So, uh, Excellent. Um, that you, you have, when, when you did talk about the one thing you had a second child on the way. Do you have two children? Uh, we have three children. Three children, okay. three children now. Um, the eldest one, who was born just before we went to San Francisco, is living close to us in Hamilton. She's oh, a wonderful. she's a lawyer, and uh, the second child is a boy. He's in England doing a doctorate at the moment, and um, the uh, the third child, also a boy, is our black sheep of the family. He's a chartered accountant. So. <laughs> <laughs> And I had interrupted you. What, what, what had we, is there something else we need to be discussing? I, that I think that's been really, I've really enjoyed it, first of all, immensely. Good. I've really, it's, it's, nice, it's nice, always nice to talk about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I don't think so. I think you've covered everything really I well. remember one last thing. What do you do with your free time? What do you do for fun? Oh, my goodness. Um, so I, I own a set of golf clubs. Um, I like to think... I play golf. In fact, that's a <laughs> tremendous exaggeration. Um, 
I do actually get out on the golf course about 12 or 15 times a year, usually with my boys, and uh, I enjoy that very much, I must say. I wish I had more time for golf. I, I like the game. Uh, I enjoy the camaraderie, I, uh, but it's, uh, I, it's difficult to free up a lot of time for right. it. Um, I like to read. I'm very interested in American history, actually, oddly enough, uh, particularly the life of the presidents. I read every biography I can about uh, American presidents, and uh, I look forward to the, the biography of the next president, whoever that's going to be. <laughs> it's going to be interesting no matter what. Yeah, very interesting time, exactly. Um, really, that's... I, you know, I, I've, uh, I find life is a nice balance, actually. You know, I've, uh, yeah. my, our, our, my wife and my, uh, my family are close by us. We, uh, we enjoy the family interactions a lot. Um, and uh, life is busy at work. And it's going to get busier, I suspect. So getting that balance is always a bit of a struggle. Do you still have extended family back in Dublin? Not really, no. Uh, my, uh, my two siblings came to... Uh, to North America, um, one uh, family doctor in Toronto, uh, the other is uh, working in Houston. She's a geneticist. Um, my parents moved over to Canada. Um, my mother's still alive and living close to us. I have um, nephew. I have uh, cousins, right, uh, sure. nephews, nieces, that sort of thing there. But and, immediate uh, family, all exactly. My wife has a lot of uh, immediate family back in Dublin, so yeah. we do go back fairly once or twice a year, I would say, to nice. visit families, so sure. it's always pleasant. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for your time. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. I, I really it. enjoyed it.